I mean, I haven't really talked about this publicly, um, but I've been having a lot of breakthroughs in therapy about this stuff because, you know, I've talked about how I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but, you know, they're definitely, I don't know, it goes deeper than that. I mean, I want to go actually go all the way back to you growing up. Tell me what it was like to, to be young Gary Tan. Okay. I mean, basically, my dad was... A, kind of a raging alcoholic his entire life yeah um, I mean I'm gonna go kind of deeper because I guess my great-grandma was really addicted to opium and um, you know obviously addiction has really plagued people I mean addiction is the worst and it's like it just causes so much pain and um, the reason why I go that back that far is like just kind of being shocked at how far back like my pain in my life went back to like the pain like inflicted from you know many generations back in my family history and so that addiction caused my grandmother to extort more and more money from my grandfather and he left the family yeah and then and then he he actually left and like I don't I don't know who my grandfather on that side is you know I think now I realize having a lot more empathy for my father that was like the defining thing like not knowing who his father was and it's like I mean it's funny because it like you know this is my father it's like it's not a movie you know this isn't like a you know a piece of fiction that I watch on HBO it's like my father's defining thing is that he never knew his father and then he you know my grandmother remarried into another wealthy family in Singapore but my father was um the stepson yeah you know how Chinese families are sometimes like, you know, what I hear about that is like his upbringing was always that of being sort of the second class citizen within his own family. Right. Yeah. And so that's why my dad left. He was like deeply damaged by, by his upbringing and his childhood such that like he couldn't keep a job. And so, you know, the hard part is we moved like eight or nine times. Um, it's funny because it, it actually it probably gave me a lot of skills, which was just being able to make friends very easily. Yeah, <laughs> these things that sort of almost break you also make you. Yeah, there's so many parallels to my own story. Where, you know, I, I feel like my my mom was similar in the Chinese diaspora. They fled the Cultural Revolution, grew up in Malaysia uh, for ten years, and had this deep scarcity mindset from like not having a lot, you know, growing up very poor in a rural area. So when she immigrated to the United States, she like brought that along. And then the way she raised us, you know, was with this scarcity mindset. It created all these patterns as an adult where I'm like, you know, I'm making money, but it's never enough. Or like, I need more. Yeah, I mean, and it's intense because, you know, now what I realize is because he, like, I, I remember growing up and he was always really, just really proud of his education, which was great because it meant that, you know, he was going to invest in my education and he pushed me really, really hard. But there's a shadow side to that. And, you know, I only actually even realized this. It sort of broke me open, like even last, like last week in therapy. Yeah. Um, I mean, for those of you who have not have ever done therapy, like the, you know, the reason why you do it is like once in a while you get this breakthrough and like, I mean, I don't know why. It's usually like you realize something. It's like an epiphany and uh, you actually break down and like cry. And like, it's like it breaks, breaks your heart open somehow. I don't know. Yeah. Like I just had this happen about this particular thing, which is, you know, because I am so grateful and thankful for everything that I have in my life now. And I never thought I would have any of that because like, you know, we didn't have money for food sometimes growing up, you know, yeah. and that's because my dad couldn't keep his job. And in those moments when he didn't keep his job, like he would drink himself basically every single day. And my mom got paid like her $14 an hour job as um, a nurse assistant. And she didn't speak English and she has a hearing impediment. So, you know, we would survive in like a one bedroom apartment. And then most, a lot of the money would go to, most of the money would basically go to rent and beer. And I remember like eating basically like bread and milk. And that was like the best I could do. We are so lucky in tech. We are so lucky. It's ridiculous, yeah. right? It's outrageous, right? We don't have to worry about this stuff. 
but like if you're working class and you don't have skills like i was that kid you know and uh like we ate well when my mom would you know every so often at her nursing home someone would drop off a bag of uh you know day you know expired bread yeah and it's like Thomas's English muffins are like my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. You know, like I, today yeah. I still, I still buy them, you know, and then I like go on Instacart and I'm like, yeah, Thomas's, that's what we're eating. And, uh, and it's like, that was like a good haul. I think that's why I love food so much now because, you know, we didn't have it. Yeah. You know, it's like crazy, you know, and it's not like my parents didn't love me, but we had like problems growing up, you know, and, um. What's your relationship with your parents like now? I mean, you know, I send them money every, uh, you know, I, I try to support them as much as I can, you know, and honestly, like, thank God, like my dad stopped, you know, he stopped drinking. He stopped, he like fell off the wagon a couple times, but, you know, sort of in the past five years in particular, I think he's really, he started going to therapy himself. Yeah. He went to AA. I brought him to AA. AA is amazing, yeah. by the way. It's like, I, you know. What's funny is like after going to AA, I realized YC and AA have a lot in common. Yeah. Like we have our mantras. We have a group therapy session. We don't feel alone. And then we have like, a, we even have sponsors, you know? Yeah. There's a sense of community of going through an experience that most people think is isolating. But then when you realize like it's a shared experience, there's like that strength in that community. Yeah. It's awesome. So so I feel super blessed now. And um, I guess the only other strange thing that I don't know if you ever feel, um, you know, earlier you're saying just this extreme expectation. Uh, it's like anyone who's Asian who has like high expectation parents. I mean, I don't know. I haven't met that many people for, who have like sort of um, are part of the Chinese diaspora in particular who like don't get that from her or parents. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize that that was like a diaspora thing. Like, you know, the emigrants, the people who left, they had to leave with like often the clothes on their back. Yeah. Right. Or they had gold like sewed into their pockets when they like, you know, had to like sneak out of the country to avoid being killed. Right. Yeah. And um, I didn't realize this, but that was like one of the defining characteristics. It's like, that's where that comes from. Right. <laughs> it's like. Our families were always the strivers. Yeah. Period. Right. They were were strivers, were successful, and then, you know, had to run and like really value that education and kind of like working hard to rebuild it. You know, and that was my grand my grandparents and their family. My my grandparents had ten children. One of my mom was one of the younger ones, and they fled China like secretly. You know, he had a, a business there, and they they had to they they fled and. Um, yeah my two uncles my two oldest uncles were like not allowed to leave they were like held in custody not they weren't like held in custody but they like had their passports i think taken or something so they couldn't leave as you know means of like getting the the of making sure the family like came back and eventually yeah. they like fled over the border to hong kong and like with their clothes on their back literally and then yeah you know that's how they the family escaped china survivors yeah it's super fucked up and i mean like you going back to what you were saying about feeling being blessed it's like you know you and i never have to deal with anything like that right like we're like yeah. even just basic Nor security kids, right hopefully like, yeah you know <laughs> yeah it's such a blessing yeah how did you know this family situation and kind of growing up in this environment how did that affect you as you know a young adult in high school and then in college like how did you, you know how did this manifest into getting into startups or programming or you know all of the standards that i hold myself to I realized my father deep down has, like he knows what success looks like. Yeah. He is super, super smart. You know, he was, you know, making his own electronic clocks in like the seventies just for fun. You know, yeah. he was a hacker's hacker. He knew that electronics and computers were going to change the world and he wanted to be a part of it. But then the addiction robbed him of that. Yeah. And then what happens that after that, I realized he basically projected all the things he wanted to do on me. But then there was also that layer of like Chinese paternalism plus alcoholism. Yeah. And so, you know, the epiphany I had recently was that he would always tell me that I was set apart. You know, I would come home with a B plus on something and he'd be like, not good enough. And I'm like, it's good enough for this person. And he'd be like, it's not good enough for you. You are set apart. 
you were, I mean, he was careful enough not to say you're better than other people, which I, I was like thankful for. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then the hard part is like, that was a, accompanied with like, if I came home with like actually a B, like a B on a test, like you're set apart, a B on the report card, I got a punch in the face. Oh my God. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I grew up like thinking that was normal yeah. and it's not normal. You know, yeah. <laughs> like that's, you know, it took a therapist to tell me like, Gary, like you went through something that is not supposed to happen to children. Yeah. And now what I realize is like the result is that I have a very extreme super ego. Yeah. That kind of keeps you on the rails. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm on the edge, you know, I'm always on the edge. If I can't come off the edge, even if I like, you know, spend a, you know, a week meditating, I probably would, like still would like the second I like came out of it, I'd be on the edge again, you know? Yeah. And it's not something I talk about. And it's not, I, I think it's not clear to people. The, the coolest thing about YouTube is that, you know, th tens of thousands of people look, you basically spend 15 minutes with me every single week about whatever I want to talk to them about. And that's really cool. Yeah. And the comments are often like, Gary, you're so Zen. Like, I love your super calming voice. Like you must meditate a lot. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding? Oh my God. <laughs> like deep down, it's like, it's a mess, right? It's like, I am like the most self-critical person. And the thing that I haven't been able to reconcile, and I'm curious, like how you think about it is like, how do you, as a creator, like I have that cycle within me. Like if my video only does like a third as well as like I usually do, like the immediate self, like it's like self hate, yeah. you, know? you know, like I punch myself in the face now, yeah. like emotionally, it's like, I feel bad. And so I've, I haven't been able to like break that apart. Cause it's like, that's the hard edge that's, you know, I can't tell if it's necessary. Yeah. It's like, you know, that really resonates with me because I had that experience my whole life, which is if it, first there's these formative experiences when you're young from your parents or peers, you know, that really made me, you know, they, where, where they were saying care about these things, right? Like care about things being, you know, good grades or being successful. Or, and then eventually you internalize that. And then for me, I was, I was repeating that to myself all through my career, right? That was a source of like my own totally. self torture, you know? And, I yeah, want to highlight yeah. well, one thing you said was like, you know, you don't see that beneath the surface, right? Like everybody thinks everybody else is like obliviously like succeeding, right? Like they're, they're, they're like, they're <laughs> no. just like, you know, I looked at like the guys from, I don't know, Dropbox or Airbnb or friends of mine who are like really successful. And I was like, oh, those guys are just like, they're super happy. They're succeeding. Nothing's wrong. You know, if I could just be there, then I'd be, you know, everything would be fixed for me. 100% positive. There are people out there who watch your videos and they're like, if I could just be where Gary's at, my life would be fucking set. Like that is the calmest guy. He's like the most confident person. He's the person who is like, that's, that's the person I want to be in the world. And yeah. they don't, you know, that's my mask, man. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's the mask. That's the mask. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's so vulnerable. You know, dude, I, I, um, I totally get it. I think deep down what I realized is like, we're not different. Like we're the same. I mean, I deeply know and believe that now, like everyone's the hero of their own story. And uh, once you think about that and that everyone has like, everyone is fighting some sort of battle or war that you don't know about, yeah. you know, that will change the way you go about, you know, the world. And then it's, and then it's a choice, right? Like we can play it, you know, we can play it the way, you know, a child would play it. You know, now that we, now, now that we're both parents, um, I realize there's sort of the innate and then there's the divine and we can, we can choose the instinct or we can choose, you know, the, the elevated and it's a choice at all times. And the more we revere ourselves and the more we are the best version of ourselves, then the more we can reflect goodness and have an impact that, I mean, frankly, that, you know, that's all I want, you know, we're all going to be forgotten. All of this stuff, like all the money in the world, everything's gonna go away. You know, now I, I, it, I, what I hear is like, he's saying like, we have this opportunity to kind of stop the generational trauma, right? Like and re stop repeating cycles that maybe were unconscious and now pass along the gift that you have to pass along to your kids, which is really the only important thing in the world is to help, you know, is to, to give them the best possible upbringing and 
opportunity, but also like, you know, for myself, I, I spent all this, I was thinking, what do I want for my kid? You know, I don't want my kid to be rich or famous. I mean, if they want, if they get that, if they want that, that's okay. But what I want is like for him to be the source of his own approval in the world, you know, for, yeah. for him to be a kind person and compassionate, uh, for him to, to be empathetic and to have self-love and love for other people. And that's all I care about. Like, I don't care about yeah. him, like, you know, him being a doctor or an entrepreneur or following my footsteps or, or anything like that. And, you know, it took so much self-work to get there, you know? How did you do that? Yeah. It, I have to admit, I'm not there. Like, you know, my, you know, Stephanie, my wife, is absolutely there. And she's like, Gary, you can't have these expectations. Um, for myself, right, you know, the way I got to it was just... Well, I remember one thing I'll share is I remember I was so proud when my brother sold Cruz. You know, my brother started Cruz and he sold, yeah, sold Cruz. I was like, Daniel's awesome. But I was really like proud for myself in a way too. It was like selfish because I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, we're like the kind of brothers who have like billion dollar companies, right? And that's like oh, a very yeah. ego, there was like an ego driven dark part of it. I remember when he when he sold it. It was interesting because it was like kind of wanting success for, for someone in my family in a selfish way. And I think I would have felt that way about my kid had I yeah. had a kid then, you know, I want my kid to be yeah. successful because that reflects well on me, right? And I think as I did the self work, you know, therapy, big part of it, the ayahuasca I've talked about, like meditation, all of these things to to realize that like I will never find satisfaction in the outside world, like lasting satisfaction. It helped me release all of the things that, you know, I thought would give me that satisfaction, you know, whether it was a you know, bigger company or making more money or having more Twitter followers or even having my son be successful, you know? Yeah, I have to admit, I mean, you hear, hearing you talk about, you know, wanting your brother to be successful, but like sort of as a, as a part of you, like that, you know, that resonates with me. Yeah. And that's the hard part. That's, that's the uh, part that I haven't reconciled. It's like my, my father played an extremely active, more active role than I wish he did right but then also if he didn't do all of those things if i didn't walk through frankly that abuse yeah but also you know his expectations and then it's not like he didn't love me also you know yeah. he also was very clear how much he like desperately loved me so those things for you were tools right like he gave yeah. you things like that's i think that was a big part of my own journey was to say oh like i had this part of me that like really wants to be liked by other people like it's the yeah. part of me that wants my more Twitter followers. And it's like, it was very unattractive for me to admit to myself at first, like, and then, but, but uh, then the first step was to admit it. And the second step was to say, Oh, like, I love that part of myself. Like I accept that part of myself. Like I am that guy. And that helped me. Like that was a tool, like the, the desire to be liked by the people helped me become a successful entrepreneur and helped me yeah. be driven to like not give up when I wanted to. I think having admitting that to myself and, and kind of accepting that part of me was a is like a kind of like was a critical step in the process of saying, okay, now how do I want to be in the world? Do I want to show up a different yeah. way? You know? But I don't think I could have just gotten to the end state of saying, oh, now I'm like Zen and I I can like accept the world as it is and I don't need things to be different without having gone through that process of seeing yeah. how I was in the world and saying, oh, okay, I accept that. Like that's from yeah. my childhood and, and that's okay. And I, I love that part of myself. Gary, thanks. Thanks so much for joining. This is a, such an amazing conversation. This is one of my favorites. Oh, Thank you, Justin. Thanks for doing this. Keep fighting the good fight. It's always great to spend time with you. Same brother.